Great. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining us today. I wanted to go through just a few points for the rapid fire session, especially given it's our first time to do this virtually. Uh, you'll notice you're watching this session, much like the plenary session from yesterday. Um, you'll view the session within your web browser, and your camera and audio will remain off. Uh, please be aware that this will be recorded so that others can watch it later. Um, each rapid fire presenter will have five minutes to present and then three minutes for your questions. Um, in terms of for chatting and questions, to ask a question, uh, please use the chat facility on the virtual platform. And this will also be where you're viewing your video. Um, please note that when asking a question, please start the question with either the name of the presenter or session number. For example, Allison Hill uh, will also post in the chat section who is currently presenting. We will try and get through as many questions as we can but there may be some spare time at the end of the session for some extra questions. Please email the MYT team if you are having difficulties using the chat facility and they will be able to help you. Uh, the MYT team are here to help. If any technical, diff diff technical difficulties, so please use the chat facility on the virtual meeting platform to ask any technical questions or email the team admin at nnnevents.com where the MYT team will reply to you Okay, with that, I think we can get underway. Oh. Hmm. Um, I'm having just a slight lag here. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so could we jump to the next step, please? I'm not getting a... Yeah, so the first presenter is Alison Hill. So I'll just spotlight her video and then she can begin the five minutes. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alison Hill. I'm the Director of Brand and Communications for the Fred Hollows Foundation. I'm joining you tonight from Sydney, Australia. And I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Indigenous people of Australia, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, whose country I join you from, and to pay my respects to not only Australia's first peoples, but the first Indigenous peoples of all land on which all of you meet. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about communications. Um, we know that stories about people affected by NTDs are essential to raising public awareness, to bring people involved in programs closer to the people that they're seeking to benefit. Now, to support NNM members to do this, last year a task team was formed to develop a communications toolkit that provides practical guidance to collect content and to tell the stories of people affected by NTDs. And we launched that toolkit at last year's NNM. Much has changed, obviously, since the toolkit was launched. The COVID-19 pandemic has significantly changed the global health landscape, with many and NTD activities coming to a stop, including communications activities that tell those important stories. And as domestic and international travel have increasingly been limited, it's become even more essential that communications teams are unable to do the work that we do. And so we need the support of others to tell those stories. And that's why the toolkit is more important than ever. Tonight, I'm going to give you a very quick run through of the key features to hopefully help you all become great uh, communications experts in helping us tell the NTD story. Um, next slide, please. So what is an NTD story? As you, as you know, NTDs are diseases of poverty that thrive in areas with limited health services and uh, basic infrastructure such as clean water and sanitation. NTD stories should authentically capture the impact of NTDs on people and communities. That might include talking to a person affected by an NTD and discussing the stigma associated with the disease and the resulting feelings of anxiety or vulnerability uh, and how the NTD has affected them socially and economically. The stories might also include though, talking to community health workers to ask about how the programs are improving health in their areas. There are many approaches that you can take to writing an NTD story, but the most critical thing is to 
consider that is your story is honest and authentic to the people who are being affected. When done well, it breaks down the barriers between us and them and reinforces the shared humanity and importance of the work that NTD agencies are doing. Next slide, please. Now, it's important when you go into the field to do your research about where you're going and to make a communications plan. You may have to adopt that plan as you go, but you should know ahead of time where you're going, the time of year and the types of stories you might be able to collect. The communications toolkit provides a checklist of the things you should do before you head off. Um, however, there's one thing that I'd really like to stress today. It's the importance of everything we do uh, gaining consent. When preparing for a story, making sure you discuss with the people at your organisation and talk about what policies are in place to protect people's consent. Consent forms are often used and should be stored appropriately and filed. And when you discuss consent with participants, make sure they're comfortable contributing and they understand that the treatment they're being provided is not dependent on them taking part in communications activities. It's really important that we make sure that the participants are at the heart of everything that we do. Next slide, please. We always say that quotes are an important part of any NTD story. The toolkit can help you ask the right questions to paint a picture of what it's like for people affected by NTDs. One common mistake people make is that they ask questions that require a yes or no answer, or that only require a one or two word answer. And if you do that, it's really hard then to give a full overview of what's happening and how people are feeling. So try to ask questions that encourage descriptive answers and have the person you know, repeat the question if they can as part of their answer. And most importantly though, make sure you listen to the answers people give you because that often then you can find a really good follow-up question to ask. And also if you can record the interview on your phone so that you can talk freely. The final part of any story, uh, next slide please, are the photographs. Photos really bring a story to life and they create a really emotional response to the story. Unfortunately, many beginners to communications lack confidence to take photographs. And so the toolkit provides some really great practical tips to help you do that. Um, you don't need a fancy camera. Everyone almost these days has a smartphone and some of the best photos are captured by smartphones. Follow three tips, keep your photos tight, bright and light. Try and get close to the subject of the photo Look out for where the light's coming from so that you get as much colour as you can uh, and make sure that you are trying to focus on the real subject involved in the picture. Next slide, please. Anyone can collect stories and photos. Here are three photos taken at a trachoma outreach camp using a smartphone. Sometimes all you need is a few details about the doctor, the waiting patients, how many people came for surgery, and that would be enough for us to share in a social media post or a story with our funders and donors. And in the time of COVID, there's never been a more important time for this type of work and for everyone to be a good communications person. So good luck in collecting your stories. Uh, and my final slide is just uh, an acknowledgement of the fact that there are a lot of people who've been involved uh, with the um, creation of the communications toolkit and the presentation tonight. So I'd just like to thank all of those people as well. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Alison. Uh, definitely an important topic um, and one that I think has a lot of relevance, particularly as we look uh, towards the um, uh, people working within country to share with us their NTD experiences. Um, I'll open the floor for any questions for the next few minutes for Alison. Scott, there is uh, one question on the virtual platform within the chat. Yeah, he's on having a bit of technical problem. If you could just read that out for me. Yeah, so uh, the question is from Kelly Bridges. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Alison. What sort, oh sorry, that's what sorts of questions um, should I be asking when interviewing people affected by NTDs or field staff? Uh, thanks, Kelly. That's a really good question. Um, I think the first important thing for you to do is make a connection with people. So um, I always think it's a really good idea to just try and, particularly if you're using a translator, 
spend a little bit of time with people and make sure they're comfortable with you um, and to get down on the same level as the person you're talking to. So if they're sitting down, you sit down as well. Um, it sounds like a really basic thing to say, but I've often seen people in the field where the subject is sitting down and they're standing up and it creates a really awkward sort of power imbalance. So get down on their level. Um, get to know them a little bit. So all of the really basic details about them, their situation, what brings them uh, into the, the, the location for the treatment that they're receiving. And then try and get some information about really what it means for their life. You know, I, I work in, in blindness prevention. And so when we talk to people who have trachoma, um, it's really important to know how long they've been impacted is the whole family impacted? What stopped them getting treatment before, if that's the case? Um, with health workers, I always think it's important to find out a bit about their background and their history. Um, why did they become a health worker? Is there someone else in their family who's been involved in medical work before? Um, are they driven by some sort of community service or have they had a family member impacted by the disease, for example? There's really a thousand questions you can ask. Um, but as I said, if you listen to the answers that someone gives you, that'll give you a good guidance as to where to go. I think sometimes people start with a big long list of questions and they're so determined to get through the questions that they don't listen to the answers. And if you listen to the answers, that'll give you a really good guide as to where to go next. Great, thank you again so much, Alison, um, for that interesting topic. Uh, now we'll be, um, discussing women, girls, and equity in NTDs. And this is presented by Rita Oliveira from the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Hi, thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, the importance of supporting girls and building resilient communities in our NTD elimination programs. Next slide, please. So as we all know, the burden of NTDs is higher in women and girls. Uh, girls are held back due to care duties, looking after their younger siblings, looking after some disabled family members, and also by farm work and house duties like water collection, clothes washing, and things like that. So these duties make them uh, be more exposed to NTDs, like trachoma when looking after their younger siblings, or schistosomiasis when collecting water. It also makes them miss school days and have poorer educational outcomes, which might eventually lead to earlier marriages and earlier pregnancies, and eventually poorer outcomes uh, later in life. So when we are thinking of a resilient community, girls really are the key. So we need to empower girls so that we can break the poverty cycle and build more resilient communities. Next, please. So when we were looking at our uh, programs that we currently fund at SIF and uh, trying to build resilient communities through our programs, these are some of the key um, interventions or strategies that we are using. So the first one is to use layered interventions. So layering uh, our NTD programs with education, WASH, sexual reproductive health and other work. For example, in the Geshiaro program we have in Ethiopia, we are building school latrines to, um, uh, to support um, STH and Shisto efforts, but these are gender segregated school latrines with special rooms that uh, enable uh, menstrual health management. And this is, is linked to integrated efforts because we know that combined concerted messages and interventions are more effective. So for example, in the Ethiopian National Deworming Program, the government is delivering hand washing and face washing messaging together in an integrated manner to support all NTDs. And also at this point in time, COVID-19 um, prevention efforts. Um, something else that is very uh, important is to have local ownership uh, and to have locally designed solutions to locally identified problems. And it's particularly important to involve women uh, as key members of the rural local communities to, to identify problems that they, they face and uh, potential solutions. So for example, in the Geshiaro program as well, um, our wash business centers, there are usually um, uh, tasked with selling um, um, slabs for um, uh, home latrines. 
um, the communities during COVID-19 identified the need and they had a demand for soap. Uh, so the wash business center started producing soap um, to, to serve the demand from the communities and it's been quite successful. Next, please. Uh, something else that we have in our programs uh, is tailored interventions, uh, which we think uh, are key to increase the program reach, but also equity. For example, the Accelerate program, um, Site Savers is training um, female surgeons in uh, some areas of Kenya where women are not comfortable or able to um, see male doctors. So these female surgeons, um, allow them to come for a TT surgery, increasing the equity of the program. And uh, we, we also think it's very important to have sustainable solutions. So we are um, very interested in building capacity to support long-term long strategies. For example, the Guinea worm eradication uh, program uh, has been able to continue their surveillance um, efforts during COVID-19 almost unimpacted because of their very strong local program capacity. Um, and finally, um, we think it's, it's key for resilient communities to go to the root causes of the problems and to really amp up the ambition to solve those problems at the root instead of what's coming um, as a solution of, the, of, of as an, outcome, an outcome of those problems. So for example, for Guinea worm eradication, um, the, the Carter Center and the, the country teams identified dogs and uh, wild animals like baboons as the uh, transmission vehicle to humans at this point. So we are, they are very, um, uh, they are making a lot of effort in tethering dogs to, to prevent transmission from dogs and also tracking baboons to understand the transmission and the, the area where the baboons circulate. And then for our Geshiaro program, we are, we are really trying to break the transmission of soil transmitted elements and schisto, not just to control, but to really eliminate uh, these infections from the area. And finally, the Accelerate program is now looking at uh, innovative strategies to speed up progress um, as, as uh, there has been delayed during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And the final slide, please. Uh, it's just to thank our partners at the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia, Site Savers, the Carter Center, the End Fund, and World Vision Ethiopia, who have been working with us uh, in all of these programs I mentioned. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rita, for that uh, discussion there. Um, I'll open up the floor for any questions for Rita. Oh, and Hazel, if you could please help me, my virtual platform is lagging tremendously. Okay, so there is a question uh, from Stephen, uh, Stephen Labib on the uh, platform. It says, Rita, how can you at some point scale local solutions to a regional, national and international level make a bigger impact? Um, if I understand correctly, it a local solution for international impact? Uh, scale local solutions to a regional, national and international level. Okay, um, so at CIF we, we, we usually start by um, piloting small programs. So for example, the Geishiaro program that we have in Ethiopia is uh, relatively small. It's in uh, one zone of uh, SNNPR. And uh, in this one zone, we are going to pilot uh, some microfinancing uh, support to local institutions. Um, and if this is successful, we then plan to expand this to um, national level and eventually, depending on um, how um, adaptable it can be to international level as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we'll now take the opportunity to hear about cross-country approaches for service delivery integration with education and health for sustainable NTD programming. 
And this is from Mario Dolagoy. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, my name is Ariel, and I'm Ariel Deligi, and I'm presenting on behalf of the World Vision and Act West teams. Um, and I'm going to be discussing cross-country approaches for service delivery, particularly looking at the integrations between education and health sectors for sustainable NTD programming. We're going to be looking at three case countries, Ghana, Senegal, and Sierra Leone, and finish off with challenges and perspectives. And I also want to acknowledge my colleague Stephen Nide and Kyle Jacobson that supported this work and their presentation. Next slide, please. So as we know, um, schools can serve as a cost-effective, reliable, and efficient NTD service delivery platform, the commonly decentralized school system, <clears throat> the interdisciplinary uh, roles of school teachers, and the available infrastructure network present a high potential to reach many high school children beyond MDA. And as ministries of education oversee the institutions that are critical platform um, for dewarming health education and linkages to related health services, the education and the health collaboration provides a unique opportunity for NTD service delivery and sustainability. Next slide, please. So for Ghana, um, the NTD program collaborates with the Ghana Education Service um, School Health Education Program, also known as SHEP, to jointly plan school-based um, MDA, train teachers, and monitor and evaluate programming. The uniqueness of this collaboration is the fact that the, the SHEP acts as a strong link between the NTD programming and the WASH activities in school, um, thereby sustaining the gains made from treatment with protective environmental and behavioral changes. Um, for specific activities related to WASH promotions in school, the Ghana Health Service provides guidance on environmental health, provides training for teachers, children, parents on WASH, provides technical assistance for the production of hygiene education material. Um, SHEP, on the other hand, strengthens and mainstream hygiene promotion curricula, sets up schools, um, health clubs, monitors environmental health, implements awareness raising and advocacy on WASH in school. It is worthy to note, though, that currently the integrating NTD messages into WASH material has begun, although it hasn't been rolled out yet, but it's being developed in a collaboration with the health promotion department. Um, next slide, please. Um, in Senegal, the uniqueness of this collaboration is the fact that the, the school health division, also known as DCMS, under the Ministry of National Education, requires school curricula to contain a health education component, including information on NTD and their prevention. And the DCMS is a strong uh, support of school-based MDA and NTD-related um, health promotion through behavior change communication awareness rising, um, raising, and teachers mobilization pre and, and post MDA. Um, partnership between the, the DCMS and the NTDP is essential for the health teams to access the school age children. And, and, and also, uh, particularly for Senegal, the coordination and the joint planning are also notable throughout the year, as the DCMS is one of the only sector that is consistently represented at all coordination meetings held, held by the NTDP or the Ministry of Health. Um, next slide, please. In Sierra Leone, in contrast to, to Ghana and, Sierra, and, and Senegal, the school health program and is under the purview of the Directorate of Primary Health Care under the Ministry of Health and Sanitation. It's interesting to note that the Shisto and, and STH control program began as school dewarming programs under the Director of Education. And the regional and the district leaders have jointly declared their support and the NTD engages the Ministry of Basic and, and uh, Education through the School Feeding Program for collaboration on school-based warming program, surveys and community mobilization, as well as ensuring adherence to school feeding practices during MDA. Um, both the district directors at, for the education and the teachers participate heavily in the planning for the warming campaigns as school continue to be under the oversight of the um, MBSS, uh, the Ministry of Education. Next slide, please. So, um, the, in terms of challenge and, and perspective, what we found is that the collaboration between those two sectors, education and health, compared to the other sectors like WASH, is really strong in countries and in many instances well coordinated with innovative and unique collaborative approaches. However, for the most part, this coordination is mainly centered around NDAs and sustainable 
tropical control programs require joint action for routine dewarming and other NTD related services and case management that go beyond MDA campaigns. So collectively as a body of organizations, um, we need to advocate for the integration of NTD and education priorities into sector policies and strategies to formalize this collaboration, as well as leveraging the school platforms to integrate WASH education materials with NTD prevention messages to maximize the impact of the school-based platform. Thank you. So I think the next slide is just an acknowledgement of all the, um, yes, all the, the different ministries of Ghana, Sierra Leone, Senegal, as well as our USAID funded program, the Act, S, Act to End NTD, FHI, and the World Visions team. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to allow Kim Jensen to uh, ask the questions within the chat box. Or to read back the questions within the chat. <laughs> thank, thank you, Scott. Currently, we don't have any questions coming in just yet for Ariel Delegi. We'll give it just a moment um, to see if anybody has any last minute questions before we go on to our next presenter. And we do have a couple of questions from the other presentations. So if you did ask a question that we didn't have time to get to, we will get to those at the end if we have some extra time. I think we're all set for now, Scott. If anything comes in late, we can add it to the list for the end of the session. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ariel. It was very interesting. Okay, um, now we'll be going to Janet Douglas with LSTM and CNTD to discuss updating, updating self-care products for chronic edema management using evidence-based practice to improve end user outcomes. Thank you to the NNN organizing committee for this opportunity. And thank you to everyone that responded to the survey. If you added your email address, you'll receive the full report and the survey will remain open until the end of the meeting. The purpose was to tap into the deep well of collective wisdom of you, the NNN members, who are out there working with people affected by chronic edema. I'm going to compare your answers to any empirical evidence that we have and best practice guidelines. Since the survey is on chronic edema, it's not surprising that most of you are working in filariasis and leprosy, nor given the NNN membership that you gave your um, NGO as either your occupation or field experience. We only have time to focus in on selected topics, so of the common skincare recommendations, which most of you considered beneficial but not accessible, let's just look at whether antibiotic soap is better than plain soap. The only study with the type of soap as the intervention showed that plain soap is just as good at washing away the bacteria and fungus as antibiotic soap. So the good news is we can at least reduce the not accessible part of that one by recommending plain or locally made soaps. If you're still not convinced, then please at least heed the advice from dermatology research, which shows that soaps with a very high pH destroy the acid mantle of the skin and shouldn't be used long term, let alone daily. So if you must go for antibacterial soap, please check that it has a pH no higher than 5.5. Consensus on the benefits of exercise and elevation are pretty much across the board, but I'm going to challenge the daytime elevation. Since the only study on elevation as a single intervention is on arms affected by breast cancer related lymphedema, which showed that the contralateral unaffected arm reduced more than the affected arm after the first hour. And after five hours of elevating the arms above the head, there was no difference in volume reduction between them, which indicates that elevation does not increase lymph flow. A paper in the journal of the American Academy of Dermatology explains why, and I quote, Elevating the extremity above the heart decreases intravascular hydrostatic pressure and thus reduces the lymph load. It is not recommended that elevation be performed during the day since this can not only hinder functionality, but can discourage exercise, which is ultimately more beneficial in the management of lymphedema. However, it can be attempted at night, end quote. So the benefits are in elevation are venous, not lymphatic which means that the most benefit will be in the early fluid rich stages of lymphedema or for people with concomitant venous insufficiency. Overnight elevation can be achieved with only a slight incline in the sleeping area. It doesn't have to be steep. In cancer related lymphedema, the benefits of daily deep breathing exercises are pretty much undisputed now. 
And they were also described in the Philari Journal in 2003, and I'm paraphrasing for time, diaphragmatic breathing is a standard component of lymphedema management. The lymphatic trunks from the lower body empty into the thoracic duct, which delivers the lymph to the large veins above the level of the heart. Unless these main lymphatic trunks are empty, they act as a static reservoir and inhibit drainage from the peripheral lymphatics. And I'd like to add from my own experience that diaphragmatic breathing costs nothing to perform and is easy to teach and learn. There was some consensus on there being benefiting compression and massage therapies and of course international best practice guidelines put compression therapies at the core of lymphedema management. We know there are significant challenges to this in most NTD, uh, NTD settings. Whilst there's less empirical evidence for lymphatic massage, expert consensus is that it should be done frequently. Self-massage is easy, easy to learn and our results from Bangladesh provide some early evidence for it, but of course we need more research on it. So the take home messages are plain soap is just as good as antibacterial soap. We should refocus limb elevation towards earlier stages of lymphedema and only not overnight only. Deep abdominal breathing should be added to all recommendations for people affected by chronic edema. And we could do more to integrate research from other populations into the recommendations that we give people in NTD settings, since most chronic edema self-care is transferable across etiologies. I wasn't sponsored to conduct the survey, but I would like to thank the Brains Trust that trialled my early drafts. And I'd also like to thank CNTD and LSTM for the opportunities that they've given me to work on improving outcomes for people affected by lymphedema. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. And now we'll open it up for questions. I'm watching the chat box, which we finally have up and running. Um, while we're waiting, I, I, uh, we have a question from Gail Davey. Um, awesome myth busting. Any comments on bandaging or not? Po are POTO and LF different here? Uh, you're on mute, Jen. There you go. I'm very sorry. No very problem. sorry. Um, Gail, no, uh, there, be, there are major differences, of course, between the way that, um, you know, other edemas and poto manifest. But in terms of what is going to actually reduce the status of the lymphedema, bandaging is going to be effective for both of them. It's going to prevent a lot of skin changes and reduce a lot of things. So the problems the problem with bandaging is not whether or not it's appropriate. The problem with bandaging is how do you apply in a setting where people can't afford the bandages? How do you make sure that you're not trapping fungus and bacteria underneath the bandages and increasing your acute attacks thereby? Um, so so I'm, I'm a great advocate for bandaging. It just has to be um, very carefully thought about in some of the settings for POTO. Great, thanks so much. Fascinating topic. Uh, and now we will look at, we'll go to Girdha Sankar from C, uh, Children Without Worms. Look at Kenya NTD partner mapping, harmonizing, harm, harmonizing program interventions and impact measurements at the country level in Kenya. Uh, Girdha, whenever you're ready. Excellent, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, like Scott mentioned, my name is Girdha Shankar. And I'm the Associate Director for Partnerships and Communications at Children Without Worms at the Task Force with Global Health. So we'll be presenting today on our recent engagement with the NTD program and partners in Kenya to harmonize program interventions and impact measurement at the county level in Kenya. Next slide, please. So um, I'll provide a brief overview of the context, the challenge, the solutions we've started working on, and next steps. Next, please. So just as a quick overview, uh, more than 25 million Kenyans are affected by at least one NTD. And these include diseases like trachoma, soil transmitted helminth infections, schistosomiasis, and uh, lymphatic filariasis, among others. And uh, there are multiple global and domestic partners working with the national NTD program towards disease control. And the national program facilitates coordination at the national level through disease-specific cross-cutting technical uh, advisory groups. 
Additionally, the National Program and Partners introduced a new strategy called the Breaking Transmission Strategy with the goal of disrupting transmission of four NTDs within a period of, uh, within a five year period in 28 counties. Next, please. Seconds, I don't have a date here. So Kenya has made um, noticeable progress towards controlling some NTDs using evidence-based strategies. However, uh, mass drug administration activities are often not as well coordinated as they could be. And depending on the disease, often different disease surveillance methodologies have been used by different implementing partners, which produce epidemiological data that are not necessarily compatible across counties. And additionally, even if there is a greater recognition of the need for coordination at the national level, this is not necessarily re reflected at the county level where the actual implementation of the activities take place. And so in order to address these challenges, we've been working with the National NTD Program and Partners since early 2020 to conduct a stakeholder analysis, map partner activities, and improve data and information sharing between partners. Next, please. Thank you. In uh, February 2020, we helped facilitate a meeting of NTD partners at the Shisto and SCH Technical Advisory Group meeting in March in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and in March, we set up an online platform for information sharing. We established a Google group. Uh, between February and April 2020, we worked with the national NTD program to identify NTD partners, identify partner specific activity, their geographical focus, and so on. And um, in April, we produced a stakeholder analysis guide that provided a time-stamped overview of partner activity at the county level in Kenya. And over the last couple of months, since May 2020, we've been working with the national program to improve information sharing between partners, particularly with respect to harmonizing disease surveillance methods for Shusto and STH. Of course, this work is ongoing, but this is the progress we've made um, over the last seven months. Next, please. Uh, this is our uh, a data gathering tool. It's a Google Sheet that was shared across partners and updated on a regular basis. Next, please. Next, please. Thank you. And this is a visual representation of the number of NTD partners by county in Kenya as of April, May 2020. Next, please. As far as next steps go, we'd like to use this forum to actively track COVID-related contingency preparedness at the county level as countries, uh, countries like Kenya begin to think about resuming NTD activities. We will continue to work with the national program to harmonize surveillance methods and eventually be able to facilitate information exchange on intervention and disease prevalence data under the leadership, of course, of the NTD program. Next, please. Please uh, drop us a line at that email listed here and uh, the resources that we've developed in partnership with the program uh, are available on our website. Next, please. I'd like to acknowledge our partners in this engagement and I thank you for your attention and welcome your feedback. Thank you. Thanks very much, Girja. I'll now open up the floor for questions. A few minutes. Well, <laughs> okay. Hey, Gerja, we'll let that marinate for a bit and come back to you at the end if any questions come up. No problem. Thanks so much. Um, I'm now uh, excited to go to a discussion on guidelines for the management of post-operative trachomatous trachiasis. And this is from my dear colleague, Dr. Fikrat Kabelevadero from the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. Dr. Fikrat. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. I'm Fikrat Bas. Scott introduced me. I'm working with uh, Mr. Afet. Uh, in my presentation, I'll share with you Ethiopia's initiative in developing a, guide, a guideline for the management of post-operative trichiasis which occurs after two weeks of the initial surgery. Next slide, please. 
post-operative trichosis a common phenomenon in trichosis program. As you can see on this slide, the situation is not different in TPS program as well. Next slide, please. So the question is, we don't have a protocol with PTT management approach to guide ophthalmic practitioners, both at national as well as at international level. The second point is that PTT cases are coming with a range of clinical presentations where each needs appropriate management approach. Next slide, please. In this presentation, we'll present a snapshot of our guideline for cross-learning and further improvement. We'll present grading of PTT, its management and training needs for managing PTT. Next slide, please. The first thing we agreed as a team is to grade PTT by taking into consideration the number of eyelashes touching the eyeball, evidence of ablation, degree of entropion among other things. Hence, we came up with a simplified four grades. The first one is PTT0, where there is none uh, PTT. The second one is PTT1, where the PTT, the post chiasis is minor. Next slide, please. Then PTT3, which is a major one and a complicated one as PTT4. Next slide, please. Then we determine the type of management for each grade of PTT, ablation for a minor one by integrated eye care workers, these are the front line uh, TT surgeons, and the ablation will be followed, of course, by caretakers or patients at all. If it is a major one, then corrective surgery using PLTR by specially trained ICW or talent nurses at a secondary eye care unit. But if it's a complicated one for PT3, it should be done. Uh, surgical correction to be done by an plastic surgeon or specially trained ophthalmologists. However, if the patient is not going to benefit from surgery or refuse surgery for that matter, it will be treated by electrolysis. In all cases, pre and post service counseling and follow up remain the standard to guarantee good outcome. Next slide, please. Now, there is a need to enhance the skills of our surgeons to enable them to manage PTT properly. Among other things, the training will include <coughs> a patient technique to ICW so that for them to do as well as to train uh, patients. Then upgrade surgical technique to ICW, ophthalmic nurses and ophthalmologists respectively and counseling for all. All training will include both classroom and practical sessions so as to assure quality outcome and patient satisfaction. Next slide, please. So, we thank you all our contributors, both uh, and the sponsors, as well as the technical team, as well as those who have uh, reviewed the guideline and gave us their comments. Thank you all for your participation. Over to you, Scott. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Fikrov. Certainly a pertinent topic. Um, I'm looking in my question box and I'm not seeing any questions, so I'll, I'll ask a question for you, Dr. Fikrov. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned upgrading the IECWs to perform the PTT surgery. Um, have you already attempted to do this? Um, I'm thinking of the fact if you have an ophthalmic surgeon that's usually required to do that, um, are there any difficulties getting the IECW skill levels um, up to that, I guess, uh, uh, optimal performance level? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> One of the concerns that we have is if a surgeon has done something bad and patients might not be comfortable to be treated again, especially to be operated by uh, those surgeons. So what we are trying to do is we select within a district and zone uh, for a certain number of districts, those very experienced uh, tracheosis surgeons and we upgrade their skills so that they can be uh, used as a referral center for a small catchment. Anything that goes beyond will be treated by a secondary, a, prime, a secondary eye care unit. So during primary training as per the WHO, one of the things that we would like to stress is more quality training and supportive supervision, surgical audit and so on, so that we can make correction as early as possible. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Fikrab. Thank you. Um, with that, I'll open the floor for questions uh, for any of our presenters. Um, I have one for Rita uh, from Gail Davy. 
Uh, she asks, have you experienced pushback against any of the interventions that you have outlined? Um, I, I was looking back at my presentation to see what, what I mentioned. I think the only one that had some pushback uh, that I can think of was uh, tethering dogs uh, in the beginning um, for guinea worm um, eradication program. In the beginning, there was some uh, concern from the population about, um, actually, from, from the uh, community health worker, uh, a little bit more than the actual population uh, in, in Chad, in particular. Uh, they were concerned that the population might not like the idea. But in fact, uh, um, it seems like it's been uh, going quite well. Uh, so the population is actually quite happy to um, have their dogs uh, tethered um, and because they are being looked after. So it's not just uh, the tethering of the dogs, but it's actually providing uh, some food and um, um, veterinary care. Uh, so I think because of that, I think um, it's been quite well received. So I, I can't think of anything that hasn't been um, well received. Great, and a, a question for Allison. Uh, do you have some examples of creative storytelling? We usually see the narrative storyline from despair to hope or a before intervention and after intervention um, storyline. Do you have any suggestions to break this cliche storyline? Yeah, really good question. I think one of the key things is trying to make sure you dig beyond those basic uh, questions that are asked. So we had a great story of a community health worker um, from Fiche in, in remote part of Ethiopia who had um, had a number of family members who who had um, suffered from trachoma um, and they trained as a nurse and they'd heard about all of the work that was going on. And so because of their family history, they'd uh, wanted to get involved in the trachoma program and ended up training to become um, a trachoma surgeon. Um, we also had another great story of a pair of um, community health workers who had uh, who were going out into communities and um, they told us about when they uh, go from a remote camp back into their village, um, they get treated like gods and, and people come up to them and hug them. And if you can get some of those great anecdotes, um, whether it be about the um, patients or about the health workers, um, you can really tell a different story. And, and it's one of the reasons that quotes are so important is you really want the story in their words as much as possible. So if you're working particularly with a, a translator, I always ask the translator to tell me exactly what the person's saying. You, you don't want the translator to say, oh, he said he thinks this. You actually want the translator to say, you know, Bill went to the shops and then he did this. You want that, that in, in their exact words. And that's a great way to kind of bring the story to life. Um, and I have a question from Mike French, uh, who wants to ask Girja uh, whether the COVID data they're collecting is specific to NTDs or is it broader? Oh, uh, really good question, Mike. Um, so right now, the goal is to gather data specific to contingency preparedness vis-a-vis -vis NTDs. Um, so, so that's what we're focusing on, but depending on the partners you know, that are part of this activity, we'd be happy to expand it to, uh, to other disease interventions as well. Uh, for example, uh, we understand that, uh, you know, just ahead of uh, launching the Shisto and SDH surveys in, in a few counties in Kenya, it's still scheduled, it's not happened yet, um, the ministry, the national program did, uh, I, I believe they might have used the tool that was developed by Site Savers. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, and then they used this tool to, um, you know, engage county um, health managers. But this was specific to NTDs. Um, but um, I, I don't believe we've listed RTI in our partner mapping activity in Kenya, but I'd be happy to chat with you offline about it.
Great. Um, I have another question from Adele Hatch. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me uh, ask from Dr. Muka. Um, Girja, you're back in the spotlight. What barriers did you observe sharing information across different levels? Oh, really, really good question. Um, I think, I don't know that we experienced barriers as much as um, just, you know, uh, time lag, if you will, in, um, in nudging and encouraging folks to share information. Um, you know, it, it takes a while, uh, especially because this is uh, an online platform and, um, you know, people have to get a, have to be comfortable understanding why this is happening. So I would say that um, it's less of a barrier and more of a, you know, um, we have to sort of cultivate patience to um, um, sort of encourage more partners to be part of this process. So um, if I will use this opportunity to encourage more partners to be a part of this, uh, really ultimately the goal is to improve um, coordination at the county level. And, and we, we're actually seeing the fruits of this um, effort already in that we're beginning to see greater um, dialogue between the Shisto and SDH communities as to what would be the right way to approach uh, surveillance um, on the ground. So let's for Barry and Morafe, let's be patient. Interesting. Um, and a question from Medell Hatch from the Carter Center. Um, Allison, any further thoughts about effective child safeguarding practices and consent and communication story gathering? Um, anyone who works with me will know this is something that I'm absolutely obsessed about, um, something that we talk a lot about at the foundation. Um, it's really, really the most important part when you're going to collect a story that you get the consent right. Um, I regularly tell our communications and, and program staff, if you don't get the proper consents, then you're wasting your time to even um, take a photograph or, or get a story because they just cannot be used. So it's really important that you have a conversation with a parent or guardian or community leader before before you even start the process um, and that you explain really clearly why you're there, what you're going to do with the photographs um, that you're taking, why it's important. And as I said in the presentation, making sure that people don't feel that if they say no, they don't want to have their photograph taken, that they then won't get um, treatment uh, or medication or whatever the service you're providing is. That's really important. Um, and then uh, I know for, for the foundation, we have um, a number of policies that talk about safeguarding um, that also talk about respecting the dignity of the patients, um, looking for any cultural issues. You know, if, if children aren't clothed, we should never take their photographs or use their photographs. So there's a lot of um, thought that's gone into improving safeguarding over a number of years. Um, the most important thing is every, every organisation probably has slightly different um, policies, but that you really, before you go into the field, you're really aware of what those policies are, um, both for safeguarding, for delivering your programs, but also for collecting um, stories, photographs, and, and other information about children in particular, but all, all of the recipients and beneficiaries we work with. Great, and we have a question for you, Dr. Fikrov, from Kim Jensen with the Carter Center. Uh, this is great to see the development of guidelines for PTT management. Uh, you mentioned electrolysis as a treatment approach for some PTT cases. Where is electrolysis currently available? Um, with the development of these guidelines, is there a need or a plan to expand the service in the future? Yeah, I think that's a good point, which is uh, actually one of the discussions among the task team. Uh, in some ophthalmic centers, especially tertiary eye centers, it is available. But uh, with this guideline, one of the things is to influence also policy at higher level. So there is a plan uh, to expand the service. And the second point was. So, sorry, Dr. Picker? What was the second point? Uh, the, the second point was how you uh, intend to make electrolysis, sorry, I've scrolled up looking for other questions. Um, where is electrolysis cur currently available and what are, with the development of these guidelines, is there a need or plan to expand the service in the future? So I think you've answered that yes. question. All right, thank you. Great. Um, I also have a question from Angelia Sanders for, from the Carter Center for Rita. 
Um, Rita, to bring back an earlier question about how to overcome challenges in hiring women. Um, for example, do you, have an, do you have examples of adapting work programs to enable women to be able to work in the field? Um, not, not exactly, uh, but we do take care in, in making sure that um, our programs that do MDA, for example, um, if, if they're doing, I, I'm thinking particularly of the Gishiaro program because we are doing a, a different MDA to what is usually, um, it's not school-based MDA for uh, Shisto and SDH, um, it's also treating adults. Uh, so we do take care to make sure the, that women um, and, and men, um, so it, it's not, uh, uh, equity is not just about women, but also men, uh, making sure that the program reaches them. So trying to uh, go to the houses at times when boats are available. Um, and other things that we are not yet doing at the moment, but we are definitely thinking of doing is about the layering of programs. Um, so we are thinking of doing something related to layering um, some of our agriculture uh, programs that we have uh, with NTD programs. And I, I think that will be a, a way of um, uh, overcoming that challenge, yeah. Great. Um, I had one question uh, for Janet Douglas. So I was curious uh, with the self-massage, um, in terms of trainings and cascading those trainings, what, what in your mind would be the best way to do that uh, in terms of skill transference? Would it be trainers that work directly with frontline health workers or would this be part of maybe an NTD general training cascade for MDA? Um, what's the best way to get that skill out into the communities in your opinion? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because usually these things are delivered by, you know, specialist allied health professionals. And, and just going back to Gail's question, what I thought about after I'd finished the answer is the other problem with bandaging is you can do more harm than good with compression if the compression's not right. The lymphatic massage is a much simpler um, proposition because it's very easy to do. And one of the things that's happened with this whole, you know, COVID business is that a lot of the stuff that I used to think had to be delivered face to face, I'm really, I'm developing now online platform for, um, uh, you know, program deliver, program deliverers to actually provide an online training uh, format for things like the deep breathing exercises and the, and the massage exercises. So that's something that I've actually got in the pipeline at the moment. It's not rocket science. And I think the main thing, the main key to it is actually helping people to understand the rationale behind it is, is probably more, more difficult than delivering the, the actual activity because it's not hard to massage someone's leg. But giving them the rationale for massaging someone's leg, that's, that's probably more, um, more where we should focus uh, efforts. Great, thank you. Um, and a question from Ahil Damani. Uh, th uh, this is for Allison. Uh, I know you mentioned taking pictures, taking pictures and voice recordings. Do you see technology playing a role in storytelling in the future? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely. I think um, storytelling uh, is changing every day in everything that we do. Um, particularly, as you say, with the use of technology, everyone these days um, has a smartphone um, and it, they're devices that, you know, 10 years ago, photos taken with smartphones couldn't be used, videos couldn't be used unless they were taken by proper video devices. Um, whenever I'm in the field now, um, I regularly shoot videos um, of walking through camps and doing those sorts of things that get used uh, in all manner of um, things I've had videos that we've shot on a smartphone used on television commercials and in, in television programming, which was something that could never be done. So it really has opened up storytelling to not just communications professionals, but to everybody. And so there's always that device there that can really help you. Um, and the other thing that, you know, if you do a voice recording of an interview with someone, you can supply that voice recording to a communications 
professional back in your head office uh, who can actually take that directly from the translated conversation and help you write that story up as if they were there in the field. Um, last week I was doing an interview with a doctor in Cambodia about the COVID response work that they're doing and we were able to turn that video interview done via Skype um, into a piece of content that's been used in newspapers in Cambodia, uh, in Australia, around the world. Um, and so there's all sorts of things that we can now do that would never have been possible even a couple of years ago. I mean, we're having the NNN virtually, so that shows what can be achieved um, to bring us all together. So we're looking at all sorts of different ways at the moment of trying to capture stories from the field, uh, given that we can't um, take communications teams uh, in country at the moment and for who knows how long. So absolutely, it's going to revolutionise everything we do. Um, short snippets of video can, can do so much and tell so many great stories. Absolutely. Uh, great, a question from Chris Ostendorf from FHF. Uh, this is for Alison as well. Uh, given the three paradigm shifts in the new WHO NTD roadmap, are there any conversations we need to generate about the language we use and the way we approach depicting in-country leadership and activities that we should be generating within the NNN? Um, I think this one's via Virginia Sara, who's uh, on about six different platforms at once. So um, thanks, Chris and Virginia. Um, the, uh, there's no doubt that we need to start thinking about um, changing our, our language with the NTD roadmap. I think the very fact that we were geared up towards um, eliminating a number of diseases by 2020 means that uh, we've now got to think about what we do towards 2030. And I think there's been a real um, shift in thinking around uh, activities being led in the global south, if you like, as opposed to being imposed upon countries. Um, and so I think some of the language we use is still probably a bit um, from the 1900s and not the, you know, the 2020s. Uh, we need to think definitely about the way we do that. And I think that's something that the um, communications working group um, can absolutely have a look at. And maybe that's the next phase beyond what we've done now with this um, communications toolkit. But I absolutely think it's something we need to have a rethink. Um, I think there's much more um, acceptance that it, it needs to be not only our programs that are led by um, country staff, but also the way we talk and communicate. Uh, I have another questions from Dr. Amuka from the Nigeria Carter Center program. Uh, this one is for Jan. Can you elaborate more on the use of bandaging in lymphedema and what benefits? Or is there any staging in the use of this? And I'm not sure there if we're talking about staging stages of lymphedema that we might bandage for, or uh, if within the bandaging process itself there is staging. Perhaps you could clarify that, Dr. Muka, but I'll pass that to Janet. In compression therapy is core management for lymphedema because one of the things that the lymphatic system does normally is actually creates a subatmospheric pressure in the subcutaneous compartment of the skin. So as soon as you have lymphatic failure, you no longer have that atmosphere pushing on that compartment. So what compression therapies do is they artificially recreate what would normally be the atmosphere pushing on the outside of the body. So the way to prevent edema from progressing is to compress it. And so we can use, um, you know, compression bandages or compression garments to do that. And if you start doing that, there's so much evidence now from breast cancer research that if you start compression therapies, when you still have a latent phase of lymphedema, you can actually prevent the lymphedema from ever progressing. You can just, you know, forget about ever having lymphedema with a course of compression early enough in the, in the stage of lymphedema. So there's no doubt that compression therapy, and then when you get to a latter stage of lymphedema, the only way to actually reverse some of the size of the limb, uh, reverse some of the very, um, you know, skin thickening, compression will reverse skin thickening, compression will prevent mossy lesions from forming. I'm sorry, I can't praise compression enough, except that in most of the settings where we're working, it's, just not accessible or it's inappropriate. You can't ask someone that's going out and working in a muddy field every day to wear a compression garment. So, you know, that that's, it's not that, that. Uh, Jen, I think we've gone on mute. 
They lean Sorry. on my space bar all the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's not, it's compression. There's different types of compression for different stages of lymphedema. Um, and that's very well established in the literature. Just, just how do we achieve that in the settings that we're working in NTDs? They have a completely different, you know, we're, in, we're just in a different paradigm to where most of the research around compression is done. Great. Well, I'm uh, just scrolling through here, making sure I've captured everyone's questions. Um, some really fantastic questions and some great discussion around those. But in less, and I'll allow just a minute or two in case there's any burning questions that have been missed, feel free to write them again. Ah, oh, here we go. Um, from Medell Hatch, uh, Girja, what was the origin of the country level data sharing? Was it promoted by the Ministry of Health, implementing partners, donor, donors, et cetera? Um, really good question, Medell. I think it was a little of everything that you just listed. Um, so CWW has been um, engaging with the NTD program in Kenya since about 2018, late 2018, 2019 or so. And we are also the convener of the STH coalition. And, um, and so as the convener of the STH coalition, our goal really is to provide a global platform for STH partners to come together. And so um, since we started working in Kenya, we figured perhaps the time is right to um, enhance coordination at the country level, at the national level, in Kenya, of course, acknowledging that there already exist uh, platforms at the national level to enhance coordination. But the more we started working um, in country, the more we realized that perhaps that coordination is not necessarily always trickling down um, to the county level. So this was something that we uh, we sort of been, you know, it, it was sort of percolating and then when we uh, went to the SDH Shisto Advisory Group meeting in, um, in February 2019, uh, no, actually, sorry, February 2020, it was earlier this year, that we broached this idea with the national program and partners and, and, and took it further. So in, in short, it was, it, was a little of, uh, it was a little of all of the above. I have a co uh, question. I have a question from Teresa Baird. This is for Rita. Uh, how do you ensure that NTD programs recruit women in paid in these paid roles? Um, yeah, I was trying to think of this. Um, we don't have any formal process right now, in as far as I know, in any of our current programs. Um, but as I mentioned, um, side savers are. Sorry about the back. Uh, side savers are um, actively hiring female surgeons to, to reach uh, women, so they are training uh, uh, women to uh, provide uh, TT surgeries um, to, to reach, uh, basically to increase equity and, and program reach. And um, in Ethiopia, for example, all of the health extension workers, there are all women, uh, they are employed by the um, the government, and um, they are all female in, in paid roles. Um, we, we don't really, I can't think of any other formal process that we have in uh, other programs, but uh, we, we do try to always have um, at least a portion of female um, em employees in, in the programs. To, to make sure the, the reach of the programs is um, as equitable as possible. Thank you, Rita. Okay, I'm doing one last call for any other questions. Otherwise, you guys can talk at the coffee break, virtual coffee break. Um, okay, then. Um, I want to thank all of the presenters um, that, you know, took on this task for a rapid fire virtual session. Uh, we were unsure how this would uh, fare, especially given just the time uh, that is inherent with the rapid fire session. Um, but I think it's gone very well. 
Um, thanks to everyone that's tuned in and asked such intuitive and important questions to really foster this discussion. Um, and uh, looking forward to our next rapid fire uh, presentation, which will be uh, coming on directly after this, after a short break. And um, yes, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. So the next rapid fire session will start in about 50 minutes and this recording will be uploaded to the platform shortly. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.